Здравствуйте, уважаемые слушатели в эфире. Очередной выпуск бесед старого спекулянта Ивана Меркурьева. И молодого инвестора Алексея Федорова. Добрый день. У нас сегодня очень интересный гость. Американский военный аналитик Скотт Риттер. Поскольку не все, наверное, Скотта Риттера знают, Алексей расскажет нам сейчас, что это за аналитик. Скотт Риттер – это военный ветеран который еще со времен Советского Союза участвовал в программах по стратегическому разоружению, то есть сокращению количества ядерного оружия, и жил долгое время в Советском Союзе. После этого принимал участие в американской операции «Буря в пустыне», после этого был советником у высокопоставленных американских военных и политиков в связи с другими военными операциями и в связи с подготовкой ко второму вторжению в Ирак, где он как раз выступал в качестве эксперта, доказывавшего, что у Ирака нет оружия ядерного поражения, еще до того, как это стало мейнстримом. Вот. А сейчас он активно анализирует как столкновение России с Украиной, так и потенциальную э, ситуацию вокруг Тайваня. Думаю, мы сегодня поговорим и о том, и о другом, но начнем, конечно же, с Украины. Программу мы будем делать на английском языке, естественно. И также естественно, что сначала мы выложим ее на английском языке, а потом уже сделаем перевод и выложим его и в аудио формате, и в обычном формате, чтобы можно было почитать. Ну а сейчас к беседе. Hello, Scott. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, let's start with the uh, Ukrainian campaign. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, we both and our listeners are more or less uh, know your views on the uh, global scale of Russian-Ukrainian conflict and other things. So I have some more specific questions, if you don't mind. And it is um, this uh, strategy, military strategy chosen by uh, Russian uh, powers uh, of using a limited force and moving slowly. Uh, do you think it's sustainable? Do you think it can lead to uh, victory? Because it seems that Ukraine can provide uh, much more manpower than Russia is willing to do and the West can provide uh, more arms. I mean, I'll be honest and say that it is not the strategy I would have proposed going in. Um, I'm a huge proponent of, uh, of coming in with everything you have, uh, that there's no such thing as a fair fight. Uh, there's only the fight that I win, and I want to win overwhelmingly. Um, but... I was not asked. <laughs> and so, yeah, the, 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 and, and I believe that, you know, you know, my approach is purely a military approach. I think that the Russian government has taken a very um, uh, a geopolitical approach that takes into account not only the military situation on the ground in Ukraine, but the political situation on the ground in Ukraine and the humanitarian situation on the ground in Ukraine. And perhaps most importantly, the political situation at home in Russia. Um, to go in with everything would have required, I believe, a either a very risky um, move. And uh, my understanding of the Russian government and their military is that they are risk averse. Uh, they don't like risks. They like to have uh, assured outcomes. Um But if you didn't mobilize and you went in with, say, the 200,000 plus troops that Russia was able to accrue on the border of Ukraine and you went in hard, uh, there was there would be a chance that you could have overwhelmed the Ukrainian military and achieved all of your objectives in a very short period of time, relatively short compared to the current campaign. Um, the problem is if you failed to do that. Um, you would then be in a very, very difficult position because now uh, the Ukrainians would have the military advantage on the ground. Uh, Russia would have to mobilize. That takes time. Um, and it could have created a political uh, crisis. 
inside domestic political crisis inside Russia. Uh, so I believe they took a different approach, and it's one that I also believe has a cultural aspect to it, meaning that, you know, as an American, I can say that I am knowledgeable of the close relationship between the Russian and Ukrainian people, culturally, historically, linguistically, and through bloodlines. I mean, there's, you scratch a Russian, you find a Ukrainian uncle or Ukrainian grandma. Um, it's it's know, very it's easy a, to uh, describe. I imagine that uh, Texas uh, left United States 30 years ago. And now they uh, say that they are anti-American. Anti right, and, and, and yet we all have relatives in Texas. Um, it would, you know, and, 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 and no, it's, you're, you're absolutely correct. But I, I'm saying that it's one thing for me to say this as an American. It's another thing for the Russians to live it, to know it, to, to, to feel it. I mean, I, I think this war is more painful for Russia than the West possibly can imagine. I think this war hurts Russia emotionally. Um, I think it hurts Russia morally, even though that they, they have a justifiable position, legally speaking. And, of course, defending the interests of ethnic Russians in Donbass is a moral uh, requirement. I, I think any war that has Russians killing Ukrainians um, is, is hard, very hard. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Russian government took the stance it did to go in with a special military operation that had, um, you know, quantifiable objectives, but was going to be conducted in a manner which sought to minimize Ukrainian civilian losses and Ukrainian military losses and damage to Ukrainian infrastructure. That was the goal. And it would be done with the resources that could be brought to bear based upon peacetime Uh, military posture, meaning Russia has not had to mobilize. Uh, Russia has not had to significantly strip down the military capabilities in other areas, although they have drawn upon military resources from other military districts. Um, you know, Russia is going in with limited capability um, and in a manner which did not, up until recently, maximize its military potential. Now, this conflict has dragged on longer than I believe um, people thought it would, although the Russian military has shown that it has been, it is very well prepared. Uh, it's not the Russians that are running out of ammunition. It's the Ukrainians. Uh, the Russian troops have a rotation now where troops fight in the front lines and then can be withdrawn to refit, rest, re-equip before putting back in. The Ukrainians do not have this. Their troops are thrown in the front line and then they are exhausted or dead. Um, and the, the other thing is the Russians have finally brought to bear uh, the, the overwhelming superiority they possess in terms of firepower, especially in artillery. And you know they are now in the process of waging a conflict that seeks to maximize Ukrainian military casualties while minimizing Russian military casualties. There are Russian military casualties. To the extent, uh, you know, to what extent, we don't know. The Russian government has been very reticent about this. But my guess is that they are significant. Not as significant as the Ukrainians have, uh, have stated, um, and definitely not as significant as the Ukrainian military, but significant nonetheless. And there is a domestic political aspect to this. While I believe the Russian people Uh, want Russia to prevail and want Russia to pursue the special military operation uh, through to victory. Victory is essential because Russia has suffered so many losses that anything less than victory will uh, make the sacrifice seem um, uh, meaningless. And so uh, in order to sustain this fight, Russia cannot engage in Uh, the kind of maneuvering that it might do against another enemy, uh, against a NATO enemy, perhaps. Um, maneuvering that maybe historians are familiar with during the Second World War, where there were big arrows on a map as Russians enveloped German forces. Operation Bagration comes to mind. Um, 
But people don't realize that even though Operation Bagration was a tremendous Russian victory, that's of course is the destruction of German Army Group Center in um, June, July, August of 1944, um, the Russians suffered horrific losses in achieving this victory. And Russia is not in a position right now where it can suffer significant losses while winning on the battlefield. So this is a slower fight. It's a slower fight brought on too by the existence of extensive Ukrainian defensive positions. Ukraine has had eight years to dig in, especially in the Donbas. And their defenses are reinforced. They are supportive, meaning that if the Russians attack one point, the Ukrainians can provide supporting firepower from other points. Uh, and they're in depth, meaning that even if you break through one defensive line, you have more to go through. Uh, and traditionally, this kind of fighting is very casually casualty intensive. Uh, the Russians are taking it slow. They are reducing the Ukrainian defenses one by one by one in a manner that maximizes Ukrainian casualties, minimizes Russian casualties. Russia can do this for a long time. Uh, when Denis Pushilin, who is the president of the Donetsk People's Republic, um, spoke in St. Petersburg uh, about a week or so ago, uh, he indicated that he anticipated that this special military operation would continue through the end of the year. Um, if that's what the president of the Donetsk People's Republic thinks, it's probably along the lines of what the Russian government likewise thinks, uh, that it will take more months to uh, finally defeat the Ukrainian army. But the defeat is inevitable. The Ukrainian forces were well-trained, highly trained, well-equipped. They have suffered massive equipment losses. This is why the Western resupply is so essential. And they have suffered losses amongst their trained personnel. Even though Ukraine has a manpower advantage, the majority of the troops that are on the front lines today are troops that were not as well trained as the troops that were originally present. These are troops that have no experience. And when you put a poorly trained uh, soldier with no experience on the front line, they tend to die in larger numbers because they make mistakes. Uh, they aren't as capable. So Ukraine will continue to pour manpower into the front lines to fight. Russia will t continue to kill them. And not only that, poorly trained persons cannot readily uh, incorporate the advanced weaponry that's being provided by the West. So whatever technological advantages might have been enjoyed by a well-trained Ukrainian soldier uh, are significantly less so with these poorly trained Ukrainians. This equipment will be destroyed. This takes time. Russia has time on its side. Ukraine does not. Why? Okay, Why? Why Ukraine does not have time? Uh, they say that uh, the amount of money uh, will be increased from Western countries in a short time. So the amount of arms delivering to Ukraine will be increased. Why do you think that Russia has time and Ukraine no? Well, I mean, take take a truckload of that money to the front line and see how many tanks it stops. The answer is zero. Um, that you, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of money going into Ukraine. Absolutely, but here's here's the reality, and we'll just use a um, statement made by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson a while ago. England is stepping up. England will help Ukraine. England will train ten thousand Ukrainian soldiers every one hundred and twenty days to NATO standards and ensure that they're equipped properly to fight the Russians. That's great. That's fantastic. Let's say they had 10,000 soldiers right now in the fields of England training. Russia will kill or remove from combat 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers in four to five days. Maybe maybe two weeks. We'll, get, we'll say two weeks at the maximum. So in two weeks... I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, uh, ten thousand in two weeks it means that one almost one thousand a day. Do you think that Ukraine casualties are this big? When you look at dead and wounded, yes. Nobody mm -hmm. talks about the wounded. 
Everybody talks about the dead. When we speak of the dead, right now we have the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, admitting to 200 dead a day. You have uh, other Ukrainian officials come in and correcting that, saying, no, the number is 500 to 600 dead a day. The Russians are killing a lot of Ukrainians. And it gets worse because as the battle goes on and Ukrainian capabilities are diminished, uh, that only increases the lethality of the Russian effort. And then, you know, so let's say we're talking four to 500 dead Ukrainians a day. That means that they're losing at least that many wounded, probably more. So I'm being very conservative when I say 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers will be removed from the battlefield um, in, in less than two weeks. And if the replacement for these 10,000 only occurs every four months, I'm just a simple Marine. My math isn't that good, but I'm smart enough to know that that's a losing equation, that Ukraine will run out of troops at a far greater pace than they can be replaced by NATO. That's why I mean time is on Russia's side. Ukraine has no time. The longer this war goes, the only thing that will happen is Ukraine will lose more men on the battlefield, more civilians caught up in the struggle, more infrastructure, more territory. And in the end, they may lose the entire nation. Okay. And uh, let's imagine the fantasy world, which Alexei starts, started already. So Texas is not USA anymore. Uh, Russian uh, government uh, provide Texas with arms and uh, started to build from Texas into USA. And uh, Texas uh, became a war threat to United States. And uh, United States has to start um, a special war operation against Texas. What will be your personal war tactic if you have, let's say, 250,000 uh, servants? <laughs> um, if you don't like me. Texas, let's say Mexico. Doesn't matter. We're in fantasy world. Oh, no, no. I, I, I understand where you're going, so it doesn't matter whether it's Texas yeah. Yeah, or yeah. it's Mexico. It's it's a um, short short logistics show, though. What I mean. Well, the first thing I do is I eliminate um, all logistics support being provided to Texas. So, any Russian airfield that serves Texas would be attacked. Any Russian port that sent ships over to help Texas would be attacked or mined. Any Russian aircraft in the air would be shot down. Any Russian satellites providing assistance to Texas would be blown out of space. I would go to war with Russia because Russia has gone to war with me. Now, what you're going to say is, well, hasn't the United States gone to war with Russia through Ukraine? And the answer is yes. Yes. But the Russian government is far more mature than I am. <laughs> because the, they, they aren't doing that. Russian government appears to recognize that I am actually slitting my throat by helping Ukraine. Uh, I am exposing my weaknesses. I am emptying my um, coffers, not only in terms of money. I mean, this is costing, you know, tens of billions of dollars at a time when the American economy is in trouble. Um, but it's also emptying my arsenals. I am providing the Ukrainians with weapons I would need if I ever have to fight the Russians. I mean, right now, there's a sad truth in NATO. Ask uh, the, the one thing that the Ukrainian war has shown, or the special military operation, whatever you want to call it, is that the face of modern large-scale conflict um, is it, it, it is, is displayed by artillery. Russia has always known that Russia, that artillery was the king of the battlefield. Uh, and that's why you have large numbers of artillery and the ability to fire and sustain a high rate of fire over time. Russia is firing over 60,000 artillery rounds a day. During Operation Desert Storm, the American military operation against Iraq in 1991, The United States fired 60,000 artillery rounds for the entire conflict. Right now, 
if we went to war with Russia, uh, NATO and the United States would use up the totality of their artillery uh, ammunition in less than one week. And then they'd be left with nothing because there is nothing. And what happens when you lose all of your artillery? Not because Russia destroyed the artillery pieces, but because you have no more ammunition. Suddenly, the Russian advantage in firepower is magnified tenfold, a hundredfold. This is the reality that NATO faces, that they cannot fight Russia right now. And yet, instead of doing the smart thing, which is to pull back and try and, and you know, retain your combat capability and then immediately in the process of producing as much ammunition as possible, they're giving it all away to Ukraine because the policy right now isn't to defeat Russia and Ukraine. I think there's a wide recognition that that will not happen. The policy, sadly, is to kill Russians in Ukraine. I mean, I'm not making this up. The Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said it's about bringing pain to Russia, to hurt Russia so badly that they will never again consider carrying out a similar operation in Europe or anywhere else. Now, to hurt Russia badly means to kill Russians. And we're not talking one, two, three Russians, a hundred. We're talking thousands of Russians. And that's what the United States is doing today. It's one of the most cynical and hypocritical uh, policies one could imagine. It's, I mean, one only has to reflect on what was happening a year ago today. U.S. headlines were screaming, Russia is paying the Taliban a bounty to kill Americans. And the only story that people could come up with to sustain this theory, which was proven false, was an attack outside of Bagram Air Base that killed three American soldiers. So America was screaming from the top of its lungs about how dastardly the Russians were for daring to pay the Taliban to kill three American soldiers. Well, America is paying the Ukrainians and equipping the Ukrainians and training the Ukrainians and providing intelligence to the Ukrainians to kill thousands of Russian soldiers. And yet you don't see Russia running around like a like a spoiled brat screaming. Russia knows what's happening. They're aware of what's happening. But Russia also knows that the longer this conflict goes on, it's not just the military defeat that NATO is suffering in Ukraine. It's the political defeat that NATO is suffering because it can't sustain another embarrassment like it did in Afghanistan a year ago. And most importantly, it's the economic defeat of the West. This massive sanctions program that was supposed to bring Russia to its knees to make the ruble rubble, quote Joe Biden, has failed and instead boomerang back on the Western economies. Europe is in a lot of trouble. It's only going to get worse. The United States is hurting, and it's only going to get worse. I'm not saying that Russia has it great. I'm sure there's some belt tightening taking place in Russia. I'm sure there's some inconvenience occurring in Russia. But the economic damage brought on by sanctions to Russia pales in comparison to what's happening in the West. I think uh, there was a report that came out that Russia had a hundred billion dollar surplus in the first quarter of this year. In the second quarter, they're projected one hundred and fifty billion dollars, and it's only going to get worse. I don't. Uh, the last time somebody tried to destroy an economy and that economy turned around and created a hundred billion dollar surplus, that's never happened. That shows that the West <laughs> plan has failed and will continue to fail. And there's no chance for success. This is why I think Russia is being patient, because they don't need to escalate. They just need the West to continue doing what it's doing, because everything the West is doing is a failed effort. Yes, you are right. And uh, you may be interested and your listeners uh, may be interested to know that uh, uh, we live in St. Petersburg. It's a big city, and maybe the situation is more difficult in some other smaller cities and villages in Russia. But in St. Petersburg, we don't feel the military operation and economic consequences at all. The only um, thing that uh, uh, I personally can think of is uh, closing of McDonald's. And uh, inability to pay with my credit card uh, through the internet, we are we cut off from the other world. 
but uh, I found out that, uh, for example, YouTube has uh, its free versions. <laughs> it's like 15 years ago when uh, uh, unlicensed uh, uh, software was a common place in Russia. So nothing really changed in our everyday life. I, 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 I can tell you this. If you could come up with a situation that caused Americans to have no longer have access to McDonald's <laughs> and, and stop using their credit cards, we would be a better country for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great joke. And uh, talking about jokes, uh, I want to tell you another one, uh, which is one of the rude jokes uh, uh, created in uh, the last month, which shows that uh, Russians really understand uh, who are we fighting against. Uh, and this joke is that uh, uh, sociology says that only half of uh, Russian military officers support special military operation. The other half uh, wants to uh, nuke Brussels and Washington. Well, I, I, I can understand the sentiment. Um, I, I would just point out, even though that was a joke, um, nuclear weapons hit both ways and uh, nobody wants that. I mean, I, again, I know that was a joke, but I... I, I just interject the seriousness of this because um, I don't know how old you guys are. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting up there in the years. Uh, we're, we're, but, we're, close, we're close to you. Okay, well, I'm 60. So I, I don't know where you were in 1983. Um, but in 1983, there was a military exercise uh, conducted by NATO called Abel Archer. And it was a, it included a command post exercise of uh, NATO's ability to uh, launch nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union in time of war. And the Soviet Union was very concerned at the time that NATO was going to carry out a preemptive military strike. And the uh, Soviet intelligence detected this exercise. And there was some belief within Soviet circles that this wasn't an exercise. This was actually going to be a NATO first strike. And the Soviet Union put its SS-20 um, missile force on alert, high alert. Um, and it, we came very close to an inadvertent nuclear war. And one of the things that Abel Archer did was create an awareness in the mind of Ronald Wilson Reagan, the president who declared that the Soviet empire was the evil empire. And by extension, that means that Russia are, Russians are evil people. Um uh, And this was an ideology that was embraced widely in the United States. And yet he was able, four years later, on December 8th, to sign a treaty with Mikhail Gorbachev, who at that time was the general secretary of the Communist Party of the, uh, of the Soviet Union, later went on to become the first president of, uh, of the Soviet Union, the only president of the Soviet Union. Um, but they signed a treaty that they eliminated these SS-20 missiles and other missiles in the Soviet arsenal and in the American arsenal as well in recognition that these weapons um, were basically a, a mutual suicide pact. Um, you know, today we don't have an INF treaty anymore. Um, my, 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 my government, unfortunately, my country, unfortunately, withdrew from it in 1919 or in 2019. Um, Russia has followed suit. And t today there's, there's talk about reintroducing these kind of weapons into Europe. But the big difference is, unlike 19, in the 1980s, there was no shooting war between NATO and, and Russia or NATO and the Soviet Union. Today, there is a shooting war. Even though NATO doesn't have troops on the ground in Ukraine, this is a proxy war. This is NATO fighting Russia on Ukrainian soil. And now we're talking about injecting the very weapons that back in the 1980s threatened everybody with immediate annihilation. I, I can't think of a more scary scenario than the one that's actually getting ready to unfold in Europe in the coming months and years. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very worried about it. So even though I know that was a joke and I, I appreciated the joke, I, um, I always jump in when nuclear weapons come up because of my personal history in this. I, I was an inspector in the, in the former Soviet Union. I, in fact, I was the first inspector on the ground in the Soviet Union when the intermediate nuclear forces began implementation in uh, July of 1988. And I take pride in the fact that I worked together with my American and Soviet colleagues to eliminate um, what it was at that time, an existential threat to 
Soviet Union, the United States, Europe, and the world. Mm -hmm. uh, from our point of view, uh, I do think that most of Russians um, recognizes this current war as a threat to life of the country. So, if this threat uh, will get in bigger, everything is possible. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I'm not Russian, but I if I were I understand. A Russian, no, of yeah. course. I, if I were a Russian, I'd be thinking this along the same lines. Huh. Yes. Uh, tell me, please, one more one or war thing. Mm, uh, they say that Russia has an advantage over NATO and over United States. Uh, states in hypersound rockets do you agree with it well i mean russia right now has the is the only nation that has or the only no because china has some hypersonics as well uh, but the the west has not fielded an operational hypersonic weapon yet uh russia has one i think it's the kh-31 uh I, I always mispronounce this word so i apologize the kinzal or dagger kinzal um, okay, yeah. kinzal okay mm -hmm. i my wife, I've been married 31 years to a wonderful former Soviet. Uh, she's from the Republic of Georgia, but she was educated in Moscow. Um, and she cringes every time I speak Russian because I find a way to butcher every word in the worst possible way. But um, <laughs> so the KH-31 Kinzhal, um, you know, is a is, is a weapon that Russia has used operationally against Ukraine, and it's proven its effectiveness. Um, there literally is no western counter to it meaning that if russia were to fire this weapon against a target in europe it will most likely hit that target uh and there's nothing the west can do to stop it um you know and so it gives russia a, a certain advantage um but it, it's not it's not what i would call a game changer meaning that just because russia possesses this weapon doesn't mean that russia is going to automatically win any military conflict, the the war would be far more complex than this. Um, but it, it, it is something that uh, if you're in the West, you know, you need to count how many KH-31 missiles Russia has and understand that pretty much every time it fires one, it's going to hit its target and it's going to do a lot of damage. Um, so, yeah, Russia has that advantage. There's no doubt about it. And I think there was a test uh, either yesterday or today of the American... Um, uh, sea launched um, hypersonic uh, weapon uh, and it failed um, mm -hmm. you know and, and one of the reasons is you know America tends to produce weapons of extreme technical complexity um, we're, we're very impressed with technology I think the Russians are more impressed with functionality um, the the kh-31 may not have all the bells and whistles that its American counterpart if there ever is an American counterpart would have. But one thing we know is that when the Russians fire the KH-31, it will probably, um, the, the engine will ignite, the guidance system will guide it to its target, and the warhead will blow up on its target. That's really all you want out of a weapon. It doesn't need to have uh, all this fancy stuff that the United States is, 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 putting, is, put, is seeking to put on its uh, weapons. So, uh, <laughs> for example, if we are um, talking about Navy... So one ship, one missile. Yes, I mean that's pretty much where we're at. There, there was a time when I when I was in the military service when um, you know what we feared from the Soviets was that you know they would saturate the uh, the battle space with um, air launched missiles uh, that would overwhelm our defenses, so that you know you would need you know twenty or so missiles to to mm -hmm. hit an American ship. Um, the, there is right now no defense against a hypersonic uh, missile and uh, yeah, one, one missile, one ship. This is why China um, is now in a very strong position if it ever wanted to make a move on Taiwan because the American fleet would have to sail through um, you know, areas of the ocean where Chinese hypersonic missiles would be able to impact the American fleet before the American fleet could have any impact on the battle in Taiwan. And uh, you said it right. One missile, one ship. The Chinese have a lot more missiles than, the, than my country has ships. Mm -hmm. 
I have one more military question to you before we move on to geopolitical, if you don't mind. And uh, when we talk about Ukraine again, uh, uh, you uh, tell the numbers of artillery shells. But uh, if you count the number of cruise missiles and uh, uh, planes which were used, um, uh, air strikes, uh, let's call it, uh, and compare the, uh, for example, Desert Storm to uh, a special military operation in Ukraine, then you have the opposite uh, mathematics. Uh, the uh, Russia doesn't have this much uh, cruise missiles and doesn't use as much and doesn't have this much uh, airplanes. So uh, in the possible conflict of uh, Russia and NATO, uh, these kind of weapons, uh, maybe they will give NATO the advantage. Um, I, I don't disagree that these are weapons that would cause Russian military commanders to stay up late at night. Um, but, you know, Russian military commanders have been staying up late at night <laughs> since Desert Storm, um, studying the way the United States fights. I, I, I can virtually guarantee you that if we went into uh, the various Russian military academies, that they have volumes of material on how America fought Desert Storm. Uh, and the lessons learned from this, and Russia reads this. This is why Russia has one of the most sophisticated integrated air defense networks the world has ever seen, uh, from the tactical level on up to the strategic level, because there is a requirement to deny the West the ability to uh, penetrate Russia's air defenses with cruise missiles and with aircraft. Um, you know, for the last 20 years, the United States has been flying tactical aircraft in support of counterinsurgency operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. Uh, at no time has the United States confronted an air defense reality that, uh, that exists, for instance, in uh, Ukraine and in Russia today. Um, so there, I, you can't, and we talk about Desert Storm. Yes, I was there. Um, We, we overwhelmed the Iraqi air defenses. But the reason why is that the Iraqis were queuing up their radars. And every time they fired up a radar, we fired what's called a harm missile. It's, a, uh, it, 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 it's an anti-radiation missile that uh, guides in on the radars and, and destroys them. Um, and we, we saturated Iraq with aircraft that were just basically daring the Iraqis to turn on their radar so we could destroy them. Um, and even even with that, uh, up until the end, the Iraqis were shooting down American aircraft. It didn't mean that the Iraqis were defenseless. It just means that the Americans had to fly uh, over, I say, 10,000 feet um, so that radar-guided weapons couldn't uh, acquire them. But the moment you went down below 10,000 feet, you were vulnerable to, um, you know, to, to anti-aircraft artillery uh, and um, some, some smaller surface-to-air missiles. Um, In Ukraine today, Ukraine, I, I think we need to respect the fact that they had um, a very sophisticated and have a very sophisticated air defense system. The S-300 uh, system, although older, is nothing to be laughed at. It is very good. And I think we also have to recognize that the Ukrainians um, don't have to worry about the vulnerability of their radar, so to speak, because their radar is actually provided to them by NATO in the United States, who is streaming in real-time uh, intelligence information about Russian air activity so that uh, uh, the, the Ukrainian air defenses can be queued up, meaning ready, knowing that a Russian airplane is coming their way, but their radar doesn't have to tell them until the last second when they turn on the radar just to you know, acquire the target to give enough data to guide the missile in. Um, this is a reality that Russia has to deal with that the United States and its allies never had to deal with uh, in Iraq in 1991, um, which is one of the reasons why the Russians perhaps, again, I can't speak for the Russian Air, Air Force. Uh, I, this is my professional speculation, so to speak. But it's one reason why I think the Russians have opted not to 
uh, carry out the kind of desert storm type air activity because uh, they could lose a lot of airplanes. And now ask yourself, if you're a Russian Air Force commander, do you want to sacrifice your Air Force um, in a in a war in, against Ukraine that you're going to win anyways? Or do you want to minimize the losses of your aircraft in case you have to use them against a NATO type uh, military? So I don't see the Russians wanting to sacrifice anything. I mean, there's the reality of war. You lose planes, you lose men, you lose equipment, but they want to minimize their losses. And the other thing is you talk about the cruise missiles. Um, we fired a lot of cruise missiles <laughs> during Desert Storm. Uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, give you an exact number because it's still classified. Um, if you try to find out how many Tomahawks actually hit their targets, uh, that number is classified. And the reason why it's classified is it's not a very impressive number. That although we fired a lot of cruise missiles, not too many of them actually hit the target. And if you take a look at the most recent significant cruise missile action by the United States, which I believe took place in 2017 against Syria, um, we didn't perform well again. So I, I think Russia is doing a very good job when it, I mean, the you know, Ukrainian air defense is shooting down some of the caliber missiles. They, they may have shot down some of the other missiles that, that, that Russia is firing, but a larger percentage of Russian uh, missiles are hitting their targets in Ukraine it was the case when America fired cruise missiles against Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. So again, I think that it's very difficult to make a direct comparison between the two. Uh, and, and then lastly, uh, the, the, the campaign objectives are far different. Our objective in Desert Storm was to carry out a strategic air campaign designed to collapse the Iraqi economy, collapse their government, collapse everything. I mean... You didn't have Saddam Hussein going on TV uh, to have a live briefing with the parliaments or congresses of any nation during Desert Storm, because had he done that, we would have killed him. Zelensky can do anything he wants. He can walk the streets of, U of Kiev. He can get on a, a video link with the U.S. Congress and beg for billions of dollars. He can speak to NATO. He can speak to the G7. If this was a genuine strategic air campaign, none of this would happen. You wouldn't have the Ukrainian parliament able to meet, to pass a vote, to do anything, let alone ban the Russian language or ban Russian books. They would be killed. The Ukrainian defense ministry would not be able to meet where, in, in, in the way that it does because they would be killed. So the Russians have shown far more constraint because it's a special military operation than they would if it was war. And I believe that changes the target deck. And that means that you don't need to fire as many missiles because militarily, you're not trying to accomplish as much. Mm -hmm. Understand. Okay, thank you. Now let's move to geopolitics. And one of my personal surprise in this uh, conflict was the level of commitment uh, from the West to support the Ukraine. I I never I we, we always understood that uh, the West the US the Europe they will uh, sanction Russia they will blame Russia they will uh, provide some some support to Ukraine but the level of uh, rhetorics of using the words of uh, like Biden said that uh, in the times of war. And the uh, amount of money provided, uh, the West, you, the, the U.S. basically is now uh, paying the salaries of the whole Ukraine, not only military, but all Ukraine, and because its economy doesn't work. And uh, the, as you said, the um, amount of uh, arms provided to Ukraine. E even uh, emptying uh, NATO own stores. This is uh, very surprising. Uh, why do you think uh, the, the West is so involved in, the, in this? Well, it's, there's, there's a couple of reasons. One, first of all, we need to understand that, the, that, that NATO and the United States have been uh, anti-Russian for a very, very long time. Uh, 
you know, we the only we've never been pro Russia, even after the the Soviet Union collapsed and you know the the new Russian Federation came in with Boris Yeltsin. Um, we weren't pro Russia; we were pro exploitation of Russia, uh, meaning that we weren't Russia's friend. Uh, we were Russia's um, uh, economic partner, but the relationship was one way. We were gouging Russia, stealing their resources, um, and we were undermining, you know, their their political future by keeping this corrupt, inept president in power. We stole an election in 1996 to keep him in power. This is a man we called a democratic president, but he shelled the Russian parliament in 19, October 1993. What democracy does that? So we weren't friends of Russia. We were we were there to exploit Russia. And then in 1999, this guy, uh, Vladimir Putin, comes along. And he, he says he's not going to play this game anymore, that Russia will not be the compliant puppy that rolls on its back uh, every time the United States comes near it, that Russia will assert its uh, proper place in the world. And this this angered so many Americans who were used to a decade of Russian subservience. Um, they felt that Russia lost the Cold War and as a defeated nation should show, you know, the proper respect to their to, to the victor, the United States. Um, and, and then you combine that with a, a nation, the United States, that has absolutely zero appreciation of who the Russians are, of what Russia is, of how Russia works. Uh, we have a simplistic um, concept of, of the Russians. Uh, and, and we think that simply if we flex our muscles, somehow Russia will cow away and cringe and hide. Well, that wasn't the case. Um, and it led to, you know, uh, one of the most iconic political speeches in modern times, which was uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, address to the Munich Security Conference in uh, 2007. Uh, where he basically said, uh, the the old way is over. Uh, there's we no longer recognize uh, the legitimacy of a unipolar world where everything revolves around the United States. It's now a multipolar reality, and Russia is one of those poles, and it has to be respected as such. This led to a you know a decisive action by NATO in uh, 2008 to invite Ukraine and Georgia in, um, and then it led to. Uh, NATO in 2014 uh, being a silent partner to a coup in Ukraine that overthrew a pro-Russian president, replaced it with a virulently anti-Russian, ultra-nationalistic uh, Ukrainian uh, you know, political reality. And then from 2014 on, um, we have NATO working with Ukraine to create the the. Uh, the circumstances which would allow Ukraine to defeat Russia militarily. Uh, Petro Poroshenko recently said that the 2015 Minsk Accords was always a sham. Ukraine was never going to implement it. Its sole purpose was to buy time for the Ukrainian army to be rebuilt and re-equipped by NATO to NATO standards so that it could defeat the Russians in Donbass and recapture Crimea. And we know NATO was a was a was, was a party to this because the, the 2015 Minsk Accords was negotiated with Germany and France, two critical NATO members. This time they call themselves the Normandy format. Um, but they were willing uh, you know, and, and complicit with this Ukrainian uh, concept. The United States put in place in Ukraine a permanent military training base where we trained up to five battalions of Ukrainian forces a year to NATO standards. And there's a slide that's been published by the Department of Defense that brags about this. And it has a giant yellow arrow going from the Western Ukrainian uh, training facility to Donbass, bragging that they were training Ukrainian forces to fight in the Donbass against the Russians. Uh, and this happened from 2015 to 2022. Um, so we, we know that the West has been virulently anti-Russian. Uh, and, you know, that that it's also been anti-Putin. Uh, one only has to take a look at what happened, you know, in 2009 when the Obama administration came in. The um, you know, they call it the reset. I think people remember the misspelled word and the embarrassing red button. Um, yes. But the uh, the reset wasn't a reset. It was regime change. It was designed to exploit the fact that uh, Vladimir Putin had 
exhausted his two terms that were constitutionally permitted and was engaged in a little bit of uh, political trickery, uh, becoming prime minister for a term while Dmitry Medvedev became president. And there was a feeling within the Obama administration that was cooked up by a guy named Michael McFaul. It might be a name familiar to you, former U.S. ambassador to Russia. But he believed that if we supported Dmitry Medvedev, that we could empower him in a way that he would retain the presidency and push Putin aside, therefore creating the conditions where we could re yeltsinize Russia, make Russia more like the 1990s than the, the than, than 2010. It failed. And, but to show the mindset of the United States, a guy named uh, Joe Biden, who was the vice president at the time, flew to Moscow in March of 2011, where he met with the Russian political opposition and told them in a meeting that Vladimir Putin should not run for re-election, that it would be bad for Russia and bad for Putin. Imagine a Russian politician flying to the United States and saying, Joe Biden shouldn't run for re-election in 2024 because it would be bad for Biden and bad for America. We would be outraged. And so was Russia. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, Putin did run for re-election. He won in uh, March of 20, uh, 2012. But since that time, the American policy hasn't just been anti-Russian. It's been anti-Putin and anti-Putin to the extent that we want Putin removed from power. So when you take a look at what's happening in Ukraine today, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the posturing has been very anti-Russian. And we know now that NATO has been working with Ukraine since 2014 to empower Ukraine to carry out a military operation against Russians in Ukraine. Um, so the concept that NATO uh, wasn't prepared to use Ukraine as a proxy um, is absurd. They were prepared since 2014. But there's two things that made this even more uh, virulent than it, it, it is. One is the political consequences of NATO's embarrassment in Afghanistan last year. NATO suffered a near fatal humiliation at the hands of the United States, no less, when the United States cut and ran without coordinating with NATO. We basically said, we're withdrawing, you're on your own. And NATO was compelled to remove itself from Afghanistan in a way that violated every promise they made to the Afghan people. When NATO considered what occurred, they realized that uh, NATO was an organization that no longer had any credibility and that this was very dangerous for NATO because NATO members were starting to question the viability of the organization and its relationship with the United States. So this is why Joe Biden began campaigning aggressively with NATO to reinvigorate it and it do so uh, using Russia as the uh, is the focal point for this reinvigoration. And so we take, you know, the, the decades of dem de demonstrated hostility towards Russia, and now we super focus it by the Afghan experience and the need to rebuild and reinvigorate with Russia as the enemy. And the final thing is, I think everybody feared Russia. Greatly. This is why early on in the special military operation, NATO was very scared to provide heavy weaponry. Very scared. But when the Russian special military operation was seen to falter, whether or not it did is another discussion. Um, the, the, the NATO sensed weakness on the part of Russia. That's why you see NATO now uh, doubling down. Now, the problem is they put all that money on the table. And it turned out that Russia wasn't weak. I think NATO now is recognizing that, wait a minute, they got that wrong. Russia's actually very strong, but it's too late. Politically, they have committed and they can't afford another embarrassment or humiliation like Afghanistan. NATO can't afford to lose in Ukraine, even though it's going to lose in Ukraine. So it is doubling down with rhetoric. It's doubling down with resources. Um, and this is why we see uh, such, you know, I mean, I've never seen rhetoric this ugly when nations aren't actually at war with one another. And I think we need to remind everybody that NATO and the United States is not at war with Russia. I mean, they are via proxy, via Ukraine, but there is no state of war between NATO, the United States, and Russia. 
their nations are There's no actual state of war between Russia and Ukraine. True. That's another advantage of the special military operation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Of course. Listen, uh, what do you think of how this uh, military operation can finish? In what uh, what result can be reached by uh, Russia, by Ukraine, uh, by NATO, by United States? So, the most probable result? The most probable result would be dictated by... Um, by the Russian government. We'll just start with that. Uh, the you know you have the United States, you have NATO, all advising people on the you know, diplomatic off ramp, a negotiated solution. Let's increase military aid to compel Russia to the negotiating table, et cetera, et cetera. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is what the Russian government wants and what they're willing to uh, you know willing to sacrifice. And what I mean by that is, are you know in order to achieve total military victory because we're at the point in this struggle where I don't believe there's any middle ground. Um, we, we, we have not only the, um, the governments of uh, the Donetsk People Republic and Lugansk People Republic calling Zelensky a war criminal, but we have the Russian government calling him a war criminal now. Um, and the Russians, unlike their Western counterparts, don't tend to say things that they don't mean it. So I think now Russia is, has, is, is, recognize the reality of the Zelensky government and the criminality of the Zelensky government, which means it's impossible for Russia to negotiate with the Zelensky government, which means the Zelensky government is, is ultimately this is going to, this conflict ends, and one of the things that ends with it is the Zelensky government. Um, I also believe that Russia has suffered um, too many losses uh, to yield um, the ethnic Russian population of Ukraine back to an ultra-nationalist Ukrainian government. I mean, the Ukrainian government has passed law after law banning Russian language, banning Russian books, banning Russian culture. Uh, and you know, Vladimir Putin has proclaimed himself to be the president who defends all of Russia. That means Russians who are, live in other lands as well. And the notion that Russia would accept a peace that had millions if not tens of millions of ru ethnic russians once again under the heel of the boot of ultra nationalist ukrainians with neo nazi tendencies uh is i i think unthinkable so i think this war doesn't end until russia um brings under its political control the totality of the ethnic russian population of ukraine um this war doesn't end until uh, the ukrainian constitution is changed to reflect two things. One, the illegality of Stepan Bandera and his ideology. And two, the permanent neutrality of Ukraine, meaning that it can never join NATO. Um, it's hard to imagine those two terms being accepted by the current Ukrainian government. So I think this war ends with the death of Ukraine as a nation state. Um, what that means territorially uh, we, we, we don't know. I don't know. The Russian government has hinted other than saying that, you know, when you had um, Dennis uh, Pushilin suggest that, um, you know, the, the territories that are populated by ethnic Russians would come under the control. You know, another question that Russia has to face now because of the way NATO has intervened is what is the fate of Transnistria? Tra Transnistria. Uh, again, my, my ability to yeah, pronounce words is struggled. But um, how do you leave half a million um, Russians and pro-Russian, sympathetic Russian people uh, stranded uh, amongst the sea of hostility. Um, you know, all you're doing is guaranteeing a future conflict uh, that may not be to your advantage. Right now, with Ukraine on its heels, Russia may, uh, may deem that it's, you know, in its best interest to uh, complete a land bridge through Odessa to, to Transnistria and, and guaranteeing that those people in that territory will never be threatened by NATO or by Ukraine or anybody. Um, this is what I think is the, is the direction we're heading. The, the question now is, um, is this truly what the Russian government wants? And what price is Russia willing to pay to accomplish this? And only the Russian government can answer that. And as I said, when this started, 
uh, I don't think like the Russian government because I would have come in with everything I had up front. Um, the Russian government has shown itself to be far more mature and far more patient than I would ever have been. Um, and they've been proven right. I think that uh, so far the events on the ground have shown the wisdom in the Russian approach. The other aspect to this that you know we need to think about when we talk about the military is the economic. And I believe that Russia is in a better position to outlast the West economically than the West is to sustain this conflict militarily, and that therefore time is on Russia's side. Uh, and that, uh, you know, we, we have a, 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 you know, the summer is upon us. Uh, this is the time when uh, Europe normally prepares for the winter by stockpiling uh, energy. Uh, they're having trouble getting enough energy just to keep their air conditioning running. Uh, they're not getting the kind of energy they need to survive the winter time. And once winter comes, I think we're looking at it a whole different political reality that will have an impact on the battlefield because NATO will be far less likely to support a war um, when the consequences of that war are causing the populations of these ostensibly democratic nations uh, to rise up in protest against their democratically elected governments that have brought them so much pain. I don't think Europe is going to buy into the notion of a Putin tax. I think the European people know darn well who caused this problem, and it's their own government and the failed policies of their government. By the way, you may be interested to know that uh, today, just today, the uh, Gazprom, uh, Russian uh, gas company, which provides uh, most of gas to Europe, uh, cancelled its dividends for the first time in its history. And we discussed it earlier today, and uh, we see it as a clear sign that uh, Gazprom is preparing to cut all of the gas, cut off, cut off all the gas to Europe this year. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a move that I've been expecting. Again, the Russians have been far more patient and far more mature um, than I think the West realized. The people sometimes take a look at at the uh, pace of Russia's response and they say it's weakness. I say it's strength. A strong nation is patient. A strong nation waits until the right time. A weak nation reacts hastily with a knee-jerk reaction. Russia isn't weak. Russia's behaving in a very measured fashion, but ultimately the West has given Russia no choice. When we speak of energy, um, I think it's important to note that Russia has always said that it is a reliable provider of energy, that it will never use energy as a weapon. And, and that's a smart move because the moment you weaponize it against country A, and but you're trying to convince country B to buy energy from you, country B would say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you weaponized it against A. How do I know once I start buying energy, you're not going to weaponize it against me? So Russia has been very reticent about cutting off supplies. And I think that the decision that will ultimately cause them to cut off the supplies will not be that Russia is seeking to use this as a weapon. If Russia wanted to use this as a weapon, it would have shut it off a long time ago and actually cause a great deal of instantaneous harm to the Ukraine or to the uh, European governments. Russia is waiting for the West to once again cut its own throat by implementing sanctions that make it impossible for Russia to meet its uh, obligations uh, under these contracts. And this is important for Russia to do because one of the reasons why Russia has this $100 billion surplus is that it's selling its energy to other nations, India, China, Pakistan, and, and elsewhere. Um, And Russia needs to make sure that these nations know that Russia is a responsible provider of energy, uh, that when you sign a contract with Russia, so long as you live up to your contractual obligations, Russia will meet its contractual obligations. But I think you're absolutely correct. Russia is positioning itself for um, terminating um, virtually every energy relationship it has with Europe. Yes. Which which means uh, extra problems for European people. Absolutely. And American people, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> no, America at least uh, has their own energy, somehow, plus minus. Well, I, And the, the, Germany, Germany, no. 
No, Germany, you're right. No, but I mean, you know, one of the problems for the United States is that our refineries are geared to a specific kind of uh, absolutely of, of crude, and um, that crude came from Venezuela. And when we cut Venezuela off, we were actually buying that crude from Russia. I think there it came out of the out of the Udmurt Republic or somewhere near the Ural Mountains. They produced a kind of oil that works very well with our refineries. And if we get rid of that Russian oil, um, we don't have anything. That we, we're going to have to spend. We're going to have to shut our refineries down, spend billions of dollars reconfiguring them, um, and that is going to create a, an immediate energy crisis here in the United States. Uh, and we're already paying a uh, record prices. I mean, I don't. You know, I got nothing to say uh, that that would make any Russian have sympathy with me. But um, <laughs> we, yeah, I used to fill up my gas tank of my Mazda CX-5. Uh, for between twenty eight and thirty dollars, uh, this morning I filled it up for sixty four dollars, and um, you know the price is only going to go higher and higher. So, you know, I, I, there will be an energy crisis. You're right; it's not going to be like Europe. Europe is literally uh, facing disaster because yes. you know, this the, the the harm that will be done to the European economy. Um, I, I think a lot of people who aren't economists are not industrialists. I think I think there's a lot of economists that aren't industrialists. What I mean by that is economists just simply look at numbers. Industrialists look at processes. And shutting down industries um, in, 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 in a haphazard fashion oftentimes means that those industries can't be restarted. And the, the damage that can be done to European industry is real and permanent. Absolutely. In my, in my opinion, Germany can uh, uh, come back to 1950s in their economy. But okay, the last question, Scott. The <laughs> last very short question. Uh, what do you think? Is it possible? Is it any possibility? Okay. For military coup in Ukraine... Uh, then uh, there is a peace, a stop of the war, and then the Russian and Ukraine army together go to Europe. Well, I'll answer the last part of that question first, and I would say no. Um, mm. Because Russia, I, I don't believe Russia, Russia is not perfect. I'll just say that right off the bat. Um, so what I mean by that is that I'm not going to pretend that the Russian government is populated by saints who um, only seek to do good in the world. Russia, of course, looks out for its own interests and um, and will always look out for its own interests. But I don't believe it's in Russia's interest to be the aggressor in a conflict against NATO, even though you might have lawyers that say that um, that bridge has already been crossed. NATO is the aggressor by supplying the Ukrainians. Um And I what is in Kaliningrad, we, where I happen to be born? To. Yeah, no, I, the, 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 look, Ukraine, Lithuania better hope that the European Union comes up with the um, compromise solution that uh, restores rail connectivity, because I don't think Russia uh, is going to have too much patience with that situation. Um, Definitely, it will not tolerate. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so, and, but in that case, Russia would be justified in, um, in carrying out whatever operations were necessary to um you know to to end uh what is an act of war the the economic blockade of territory of the russian federation i mean i, I don't know what lithuania was thinking i don't know what nato was thinking um it's a very dangerous situation do, do, do you believe they are thinking if they are thinking I, you're right i mean again i i don't mean to be too coy um but the um The, the recent NATO summit in Madrid is not uh, a, a good indicator of a viable thought process coming out from NATO, Europe, the G7, the United States. But now we come to the first part. You know, I'm a prisoner of data that I can't confirm to be accurate, meaning that I'm even though I'm a former intelligence officer, I don't uh, have access to high quality intelligence information anymore. And if I did, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Definitely. Um, so I, I'm a prisoner to, to to the sources that I have. Open um, sources, as we are all. Yeah, as we all are. The Ukrainian um, 
you know, telegram channels, which I follow, um, seem to indicate that there is a growing rift between the office of the presidency and the Ukrainian military, that the Ukrainian military is frustrated that some of its best forces are being sacrificed needlessly for political reasons. Um, and they're, 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 that, you know, they are frustrated. But so far, the Ukrainian military has implemented the orders given to it by the presidency. Uh, but the question is, is there a tipping point? Um, and then the other question is, is the Ukrainian military capable of a coup? And what I mean by capable, remember, they've been trained for the last eight years to NATO standards. And one of the key things of, um, of, of the training that's provided by NATO to uh, officers of other nations is the concept of civilian control of the military. And that it's absolutely anathema for the military to ever consider rising up against its civilian masters. Now, are there sufficient Ukrainian officers that um, don't care about that training? Uh, that training didn't uh, it didn't resonate with them, um, or just there's a new reality that they have to respond to that they would uh, feel it necessary to to carry out a coup? Um, you know, I don't have the answer to that. What I can say is that the situation in Ukraine, in my belief, is only going to get worse militarily and that the strains between the office of the presidency and the Ukrainian military are going to get deeper um, and that if the Ukrainian presidency doesn't adjust to this reality and start to take into consideration um, the advice given to it by the military advice given to it by the Ukrainian general staff, um, then the chances of a coup such of a, a type that you mentioned are very high. Now, the, the question is, would the Russian government, you know, how would the Russian government respond to this? Uh, would the coup uh, seek to end uh, Ukrainian uh, struggle against Russia or simply replace Zelensky with a more um, capable leadership that would listen to the Ukrainian uh, military, how would NATO respond uh, in the aftermath of a coup uh, that clearly proved that Ukraine is not a democratic nation? Uh, and there's just a whole bunch of, 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 of complex things. But at, at the end of the day, well, I do believe if there was ever a Ukrainian military and Russian military collaboration, it would be simply to secure the totality of Ukrainian soil um, uh, from NATO. Uh, but that would be the limit of their uh, of their uh, cooperation that uh, I don't believe that uh, Russia or Ukraine or some sort of um, hybrid Russian Ukrainian collaboration brought on by a coup uh, would ever have the political will um, to to launch a, an attack against NATO, nor would it have, I believe, the, po the, the military means to see such an attack uh, through to fruition. Um, you know, it's one thing to talk about NATO in their military in terms of offensive capability, but every military, uh, especially when defending their home soil, um, becomes a very effective defender. And, um, you know, for Russia and Ukraine to launch an attack into uh, a NATO country, uh, I think that's just a completely different military picture than what we're currently seeing today in Ukraine. Now, one of the reasons why the Ukrainians are fighting so hard is they're defending their soil. Um, they're, you know, they, they have, they have reasons to, uh, to be willing to sacrifice their lives if necessary. Um, and this would be the same for Czech troops, for Polish troops, for Romanian troops, for, uh, Slo Slovakian troops, uh, anybody defending their soil, Latvia Lithuania, Estonia, um, their, their, their military effectiveness goes up exponentially when you're defending your hometown. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scott, thank you very much. It was uh, very insightful and uh, it was pleasure to talk to you and hope to talk to you some other time also. Anytime. Thank you very much for having me on.